Hello. So as I start this video, I will ask you a question. Have you ever been in the following situation? You have your Python script in which you're reading in data, perhaps from some sensor. You're then performing some long operation on this data. And then what you're doing is you're going ahead and just plotting this data as fast as possible. And you have a problem in that the operation that you do on the data takes so long that it starts to affect your plotting performance. So here I have a simulated operation that's taking around 100 to 200 milliseconds every time it's done. And so in the plot, the plot is limited to be at least as long as those 100 to 200 millisecond intervals, not to mention the time taken on top of that plot. In this video, I'm going to show how you can use the multiprocessing module to very easily overcome these limitations. And by using the multiprocessing module, we can go from something that looks like this to something that looks like this. You see the plot is now far smoother as we've offloaded the task of doing this long operation to threads that execute simultaneously. So this is simultaneous threading in Python. And the easiest way to think about this is the following. We have our data operation, and let's, for the sake of the example, say it takes 100 milliseconds. What actually happens is that the, let's pretend as well that getting the data from the sensor is very quick. You know, typically getting data might be a very quick operation, so the time is not of concern. However, what we're essentially doing, is we're doing something to th some data and then plotting, doing something to some data and then plotting, etc., etc. And you can see that ultimately we're limited in frame rate of the plot by the sum of the data operation and the plotting operation. So at best here, we could get around 6.25 Hertz. If however, we could multi-thread our application, we'd be able to get a dramatic improvement. So now you see what's happening is that because the data operation is being performed on threads that can execute simultaneously, we're then free to simply just keep plotting over and over again as the heavy lifting is done on another simultaneous thread. This then leads to the situation where we're basically just limited by the time it takes to plot, which in this particular example would lead to an FPS of around 16.7 Hertz, which is almost a three times improvement. And so how do we do this? So in the first example, I have a simple bit of Python. There's a function called create plot, which only job is to just create a figure in an axis from the matplotlib pyplot library. We then go into this loop here. So this is just, an, this is just a for loop that will execute 300 times. All we're telling it to do is to update, run this update function and then update the canvas and then draw it again with a small time delay just to allow the plot to draw. So these two operations here can take considerable time. So imagine, so these are the operations I said were taking 60 milliseconds. And then in this update function here, what we do is we get some data. So this could be get the data from a sensor. We then perform some operation on it. So this could be a long operation. So in my example here, the long operation has just been replaced with a time delay. And then once the operation is completed, we then go ahead and set the data on the plot before returning from the function. And so if this operation here takes 100 milliseconds, and the combined sum of this operation and these operations is 160 milliseconds. And so we're ultimately limited by the combined sum of these two. In order to multi-thread, simultaneously multi-thread, we need to offload this operation to some other threads. And so the first thing we need to do is to import multiprocessing. So that's a Python package that comes with the standard Python library. And then from this multiprocessing, package, we're going to subclass the multiprocessing.process class. And it's very simple. All we're going to do is in the initializer for this subclass is we're going to accept two queues. One will be an in queue, one will be an out queue. So one queue will be for receiving data, one queue will be for sending data. We go ahead and assign those as class level variables or instance variables. And so they're accessible from anywhere inside the class. We then must remember to run the initializer for the host class, so the mp.processing class. And then the last thing the multiprocessing process class needs is a run function. So we override the run method. And all we do here is implement an infinite loop, so while true, with a time.sleep, so we're not constantly thrashing the thread. And then we check if an item is found in the in queue, so data coming in, then we do something with it. So what do we do? We get the data from the in queue. We then perform our operation on the data. So this is the same operation as was listed here. So this long operation that takes 
100 milliseconds at least. Once that operation is complete, we then put the operated data back into the queue. The input data will look as follows. It will be a dictionary with an X and a Y key, along with a timestamp TS. After we've completed the operation, we'll send back the same timestamp. So the host, the thread that is sending data into the in queue, knows at what time it sent the data into the queue, along with another two keys for the processed data. So it's very, very simple, just a few lines of code in order for us to do some work. So typically these process, these things might be called workers. So some people would call this a worker thread. And then what do we do? So for the multiprocessor to work, we have to have the guard. So the name equals main guard that prevents the sub processes that are spawned from just going into an infinite loop because they will be spawned without the if name equals main. We then add an FPS variable. So this, think of this as a limit. It doesn't mean that our plot will run at 30 FPS, but it limits the plot to 30 FPS. So say we were doing a very quick operation or the plotting was actually very quick. This will limit the FPS to 30. Then we create two multiprocessing queues. So these are thread safe queues. They can be shared between multiple threads and have many protections associated with them. So no two threads could access the same element of the queue. So they're thread safe. And we create an in queue and an out queue. So in queue will be data coming back from the processes and out queue will be data going to the processes. I've manually put in here to use eight processes, but the multiprocessing modules does have a function called CPU count, which will get the number of cores available for processing, which on my particular computer is 16 which corresponds to the number of logical cores, not to the number of physical cores. So it will allow execution of 16 processes. And then we go ahead and create them. So we create a, uh, a list called prox for processes. We then create individual process classes, noting that I swapped the in queue and out queue from the main function because the queue going out of the main function into each process should be the in queue for that particular process. So we create 16 of those in my case. And then for each one of those processes, we start it. And we know that the, the process itself will just start. So when it, when, you hit, when you call the start method, it will implement the run function. And so we know it will just be in an infinite loop waiting for data to come in to be processed. We then do the same where we create our figure. I've added a little bit of text in the top right so we can keep track of the queue size. And then I've got a few variables here. So T start will be the starting time, reference this time.performance counter. T next will be the next time that we need to plot. So this is what we're going to use in order to time our plotting. And T last will be the last value of time that was got from one of these processes. So when we send data out, we'll be timestamping it with the current time. And the last time received will be keeping track of so that we don't accidentally plot data that came in at the wrong time. Not so much of a concern for this example, because that's very unlikely to happen, but could happen in your case. We then have our update function, which is again has changed quite a lot. So I've added in the global TLAS, so we have a direct handle to this TLAS parameter. We then do the same thing where we go ahead and grab the data, but this time, every time in the loop, we grab some data and then put that data to the out queue. So we send it as a dictionary with a timestamp as the current time, giving back the performance counter, and then the X and Y values, so the data. And if you remember from our little diagram here, we're seeing here that every time we come in the loop, we send it some data. So the data going in is at the same rate as the plot. So we shouldn't have the situation where we end up sending too much data to the workers and the plot lags significantly behind. But that is something you could do if, say, you was reading data from a file and wanted to just plot it as fast as possible. There's no reason you'd have to read it in and process it at the same rate. I think of this as more of a rate control. And then always go ahead and plot the queue size in the top left. And then we have our little block of code here. So while the in, while the in queue has a queue size, so think of this as consuming the queue. So when we come into this function, it might be that there may be more than one element in the queue because this long operation that we're seeing is occurring has a variable time associated with it. And also the processor itself can have some time associated with its execution. So it might be that more than one element comes back from the queue during and during one execution of this update function. And so what we do is we consume the entire queue and all we do is you go through the queue, get the, get the item from the queue, and then we check whether it's timestamp. So the time that data was sent to a process is greater than the timestamp of the last time we actually plotted some data. If it is, then we go ahead and set the data that we want to plot as this queue data. And then we continue in this loop until we've exhausted all the elements of the queue. And if we did have some new data to plot, 
we go ahead and toggle this boolean here called replot. This boolean here then tells the next part of this function, or the last part of this function, to go ahead and do the same replotting as we did before. So change the data on the plot. Every time it comes in this loop, it sends some data to into the queue. One of the process picks it up. It's not determined which one exactly it's picked it up. It depends on everyone, which everyone gets there first. And then it checks to see whether any data has come back from the queue. If any of data has come back in the queue, it then tries to find the most recent one. If some more recent data was found in the queue, it then goes ahead and readjusts the data inside the plot. Okay, and that's all managed from within our same for loop as before. So we're just going over all the frames, but this time we've got a little function here that basically just checks if the current time is less than the next time. If the current time is not less than the next time, it will just go ahead and do this plot.pause, which gives the type, which basically hand gives over some processing of the main thread to the matplotlib figure object. So it has a bit of time to actually do some stuff. And then it will keep coming back and continues to check in. Once the current time exceeds the next time it should be, it goes ahead and sets the next time to the current time plus the time increment. So for example, in this 30 FPS, it will set it for 33 milliseconds later. Then goes ahead and calls this update function and then does the drawing. So it's really simple how it works. And you can really see that it does work. So this is a lot faster than it was before. We also get our little queue size indication here. You can see that sometimes it comes in, there's no data in the queue. Sometimes it comes in as one, sometimes there's two. There's very rarely more or less. And that's just how, because that's just how we've implemented it. And also it doesn't mean that this plot is going at 30 frames a second. Remember that was just the maximum possible. We can see this is a lot smoother than it was before without using the simultaneous multi-threading. Now, why do I keep saying simultaneous multi-threading when this is called multi-processing? So in Python, it's a bit different. So typically when people say multi-threading, a thread is just a process that's executing on a computer. And the typical implementation of Python means only one thread can be operating at any one time. So even though you can multi-thread a Python program, it doesn't mean that two threads can necessarily be executing at the same time. So they don't have concurrent execution so I think that's best illustrated with this diagram here. So I'll put a link in the description below. But basically, because these uh, the C Python implementation relies on this global interpreter lock, what it means is that even if you have multiple threads in Python, so for example, the matplotlib library, so the, the figures in the background run on a different thread, it doesn't mean that they are running in parallel. So what actually happens is we're doing stuff in our first thread. What happens is then the CPython implementation will then go ahead and give other threads some time to do some processing every so often. And so for operations like this, this actually hinders our performance, but it's not all doom and gloom because for some operations, so for things like IO requests are in fact the operation we've actually done here in which we've done time.sleep as our long operation since it's just a simulation. This would actually allow other threads to execute. So when this time.sleep is encountered, if we were doing multi-threading, then the CPython interpreter could then give another thread some time to execute. So that could also be doing something here, simultane uh, not simultaneously. It's reserved another time slot. And then when that's completed, or after a certain amount of time, which I can't actually remember what the time is, it would then come back to this thread to execute. But if, for example, this was actually something more extreme, or some very, very long operation, then there is no opportunity there for a real speed up because there's no real IO blocking. And so simultaneous multiprocessing is the way to go forward. And that's why we use the multiprocessing module. It does mean that we don't have access to any of any shared variables or anything. So any variables that were created in here can then be passed to the other process using the class initialize variables and these queues are specifically designed for this to pass data between these multi simultaneous multi-threads. I think one more thing to note as well is that if your long operation is an operation that is actually multi-threaded in itself that this particular implementation will not work. So for example if the actual long operation was this FFT function that I was doing here then there would be no benefit to multi-processing because this FFT function here Sorry, there would be little benefit 
to doing the multi-processing because this FFT operation here behind the scenes I believe is already multi-threaded and so really it depends on whether the operation that you're performing on the data is limited by its single thread performance or its single core performance in that case you will get a speed up for the multi-threaded operation so I hope you found this uh, interesting I think it's been quite a quite a quick example just showing you how you can do a very basic implementation but just because it's basic doesn't mean it's not useful so I have done things like this in the past so for work I've created little GUI applications which are running on Python and then what I need to do is I need to do some plotting in some little GUI framework and by having the data processing in a separate thread and even things like the data gathering in a separate simultaneous thread it just takes the strain off the main thread and it actually leads to much more responsive programs so at no point do you ever want to be waiting hundreds of milliseconds for an operation to complete ideal operations should be completed as quick as possible and if not move them into a different thread if possible so thanks for watching hope you enjoyed it and i'll see you next time